Episode 69. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Our guest tonight wants to go by his first name only. Paul, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Vic. It's real good to be here. Paul, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I uh, spent most of my life in southern Wisconsin, near the Illinois border. Went to college at University of Wisconsin as a wildlife biology major. Currently a student for nursing. I'm 32 years old and spent most of my extracurricular time out in the woods hunting and fishing and bird watching, taking pictures, wildlife photography, that sort of thing. And currently back in the Boyd area, was living in Green Bay, and it's good to be back and have the opportunity to experience the outdoors down here that I grew up in and encountered many uh, strange things in the woods of southern Wisconsin. Yeah, I'd say you did. After that pre-interview, sounds like more than a few strange things. You know, most of the conversation here tonight that you're going to throw at us revolves around the Avon Bottoms area. Please fill us in on why that area is so strange. Well, Avon Bottoms, I didn't really discover till I want to say, 15 or 16 years old, roughly. Uh, I spent most time with my dad on the weekends hunting. It's about, I want to say few thousand acres, maybe over 3,000 acres now. The DNR acquires more and more property out there. And it's a very unique watershed in the Midwest. It's unlike anything I've ever seen in anywhere else in the state of Wisconsin. I've traveled around quite a bit of the state, and it's, it's kind of got the feel of a Tennessee swamp, so to speak. Kind of a real backwoods, backwater kind of area. The terrain here in the southwest part of the state is primarily rolling hills and a lot of farmland, a lot of agricultural area. But Avon Bottoms itself is one of the few places you can go where there's a lot of untouched, untapped wildlife area preserved for people who want to hunt. It's primarily all public hunting grounds and it's a great opportunity to go out there day and night to fish. We do a lot of catfishing out there. It's a place where a lot of people come to deer hunt from all over the state, Illinois as well, which is probably about five minutes from Avon Bottoms, the border. It is a heavily trafficked area during deer season, but apart from that, not a lot of people get up in there. And the Sugar River flows through it. And the Sugar River is, you know, at times maybe 50 feet wide. It's relatively narrow, but it's a real deep river with a lot of undercut banks. And it's very hard to navigate. Even with a boat, you have a hard time getting up through there and finding places that are secluded to hunt or fish. So I could imagine it'd be a really good place for someone or something to hide out. If it wanted to be hidden from the rest of the world, it would really be an issue. <laughs> and there have been talks of folks hiding out out there, living off the land, and I could see why it would be a really great place for that if you wanted to get off the grid. So it's one of the few wild places you can go in the whole southern tier of the state, really. Paul, you mentioned all the hunters that migrate to that area when season comes in. You had a pretty unnerving experience of your own one year when you were deer hunting. Please tell us about that. It's kind of a common thing to happen in the public hunting grounds of Wisconsin. A guy would go out there to go deer hunting, and that particular morning I didn't go to my usual spot, which is about an hour away. I went to Avon Bottoms, which is only about 20 minutes away. And I wanted to get out there early and get back far into the woods enough to where I wouldn't run into any other hunters. Probably around four in the morning, I started walking from the parking lot. 
uh, I'd say I put about an hour and a half in a good walk and used my GPS to navigate myself back in through the woods to get far enough off the road to the river, set up in a spot that I knew. And unfortunately, as the sun began to rise, there was a lot of uh, orange popping up here and there all around me, <laughs> thinking I was far enough back to get away from them. I, I thought wrong, evidently. All of a sudden, I could see in the distance, I could hear shots, and I could see a deer running through an open field, kind of on the outskirts of the, the woods. And this poor deer had probably 15 or so guys shooting at him. And it came my way. It was running directly down the edge of the woods where I was posted up in the corner of the field. At that moment, I pretty much just dropped down and laid down next to the tree in a fetal position. I could hear slugs whizzing above my head. After that day, I decided never to hunt public hunting grounds again in Wisconsin. It's uh, kind of a dangerous gamble, so to speak, with all the population of hunters out there. At that moment, that's the, uh, the opening regular deer season in Wisconsin. It's probably the busiest time of year in public hunting grounds. This place is normally uh, right on the river. There's a there's a trail, and normally other times of year people fish there. Pretty decent amount of folk come out there. On any given night, you might see one or two people in the summertime. But in the fall, it's pretty dead apart from the deer season. There's really not a lot of people that go out there. And in the summer, with the fishing. The people that brave the mosquitoes out there, and I'll tell you what, they're the worst mosquitoes I've ever experienced. And I got a good friend that lived in Alaska and all over the South, and he's been to Venezuela and Vietnam and all over the world. And he claims that's the worst mosquitoes he's ever experienced ever out there. So they're just nothing like it. You can't even hear yourself think. They're just constantly buzzing in your ear. So as far as the, the warmer months go in June, July, August, it's almost impossible to go out there without a full bug suit, so not a lot of people will venture out that area to fish or whatnot. But as far as uh, it being kind of a place where kids will go and kind of a make-out spot, unfortunately it's also a secluded enough spot where people will dump anything from tires to washing machines to their garbage and whatnot. So it's kind of a laid-back area, not really touched by law enforcement in general. Fortunately, though, in recent years, the DNR have spent a little more time out there, and I guess we can possibly get into that a little bit later. The uh, local game warden has talked to me about people that have experienced similar dogman encounters in that area, and they're really not too afraid to talk about it. They don't deny it. <laughs> and as far as the DNR go, they usually deny stuff about cougar sightings and bear sightings in that part of the state. They try to keep that under wraps. So it was kind of a, a shocker to hear him say that he had heard stories from from folks out there, local farmers and uh, hunters and whatnot that go out in the area and have had encounters themselves. That is surprising because, like you alluded to just a second ago, people like that who work for the DNR are so tight-lipped about things like that. It's very rare for them to open up and let you know that things like that have occurred in the past. Before we move on to Paul, didn't you mention that missing persons cases are higher in that area than the national average? Yeah, well, it's not far from the city of Beloit. Unfortunately, uh, Beloit has a reputation of a lot of gang activity and a lot of shootings and a generally higher crime rate than a normal city of about 36,000 people. And it's not a suburb of any large city. It's about two hours from Chicago, roughly, about half an hour from Rockford. It just happens to be on I-90. From what I gather, it's a major drug hub, so you got a lot of people coming through that area, a lot of gangs that are selling drugs in the area. Unfortunately, there's been times where I've been out there and, and seen actual drug deals go down, seen vehicles, you know, on 22-inch rims that don't belong out in public hunting grounds dealing drugs. And uh, there's been a history, allegedly, of uh, certain mafia groups dumping bodies out there. There was a 
particular story that went around the city of Broadhead, which is, Broadhead is the closest city to Avon. Avon kind of lies about maybe five miles or so from Broadhead, not very far. And a lot of the local kids talked about uh, a girl who was kidnapped and brutally murdered with, a, I believe, a hammer on one of the bridges and dumped into the irrigation ditch. Uh, there was also a body that this was in the news um, up on Nelson Road that was dumped on the side of the road and found in the winter time, uh, not too many years ago. So it is a, a very secluded area where there is an element of criminal activity because of its basically being in the middle of nowhere <laughs> as far as most of the southern central part of the state goes. Yeah, since it's that isolated, I'm not all that surprised that it does attract activity like that, unfortunately. All right, Paul, let's get into this first encounter you had. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. It was uh, towards the end of November. There wasn't any foliage on the leaves. And it was a perfect night for hunting. No wind, dark. There was no moon that night. I remember that. And we decided to go out raccoon hunting, and it was just a perfect night for raccoon hunting. Now, what we did was we drive through the bottoms area, back and forth through all the the roads that led through the public hunting ground, and wait for a raccoon to run across the road. And then we would get out and track it, chase it down, and that's how we raccoon hunted. We didn't have the luxury of dogs. I was 18 years old at the time, and that's just kind of how we did things. We would even pick up raccoons off the side of the road and sell the pelts. Back then, you could make a pretty good chunk of money off raccoon pelts. Unfortunately, nowadays, there is no real fur trade here in this part of the state. But Friday night, Saturday night, weekends, we would go out raccoon hunting. Well, one particular night, we were heading down Nelson Road. And we were just about to the bridge, and there's a parking lot on the right. We always kind of pulled in there and kind of gathered our thoughts, kind of came up with our game plan for the night. And a lot of times we would drive through the area. If nothing was going on, we would pull off and walk through the woods until we heard something and just kind of chase after it. (laughs) We didn't have a lot of experience raccoon hunting, and it was just, Kind of our way of doing things, which is a little different than a lot of people, I guess. But we were very successful at it. And, you know, on a a good night, we'd get about $300 worth of pelts. That particular night, we pulled into the parking lot. And I noticed something on the edge of the parking lot up in the trees. These are all like scrub type trees, maybe an inch or two in diameter. And the parking lot itself was probably, shoot, 30 by 20 feet or so. Not a very big parking lot, a little gravel turn off, you know. Right next to the road, there wasn't really much of a driveway into the parking lot, so it was pretty much right on the road. And my buddy and I got out of the truck and had our flashlights out and walked over to the edge of the parking lot to kind of investigate what we saw on the tree. It wasn't moving when we we pulled in. We didn't really take much note of what it could have been. At first, I thought it was like a black plastic garbage bag hanging in the tree. Now, mind you, there's a lot of people that dump their trash out there. So, didn't really think anything of it. And as we approached it, we could tell it was an animal. I walked up to it, we got close, and it was a cat. And... That poor cat was dead, and it was impaled on the tree. Now, that was peculiar. That, to me, was you know, pretty sick, minded of somebody to do that, I thought. You know, I thought maybe somebody had put the cat in a tree to maybe get coyotes to come in and hunt the coyotes or whatever they were thinking. And then I, as I looked closer, it looked soaking wet. I ain't, it, ain't, it hadn't rained that day, I know that. It hadn't been raining or nothing. And I touched it. And this really creeped me out. This really creeped both of us out a lot, like to the point where I think at that time we were debating about getting out of there. When I touched it, it was almost like saliva. 
it was just goo, clear goo, like something had been chewing on it. Now, this cat was probably all of six feet up in the tree. So I can't imagine anything in the Wisconsin woods apart from maybe a bear or maybe a coyote jumping on its hind legs, reaching up at it, grabbing it to chew on it. There are plenty of coyotes in that area, but there never really have been bear sightings in southern Wisconsin up until recent years, maybe the past five years. And this was back in 01, so nobody ever thought twice about a bear being in Rock County or even Green County or Dane County for that part. But I kind of got freaked out, and my buddy said, man, I wonder what was chewing on that, something was chewing on it, you know. So I decided we'd go back to the truck and walk the, you know, 20 feet or so back to the truck. And we grabbed our shotguns out and loaded them and got our spotlights out. We were sitting right on the truck, which is probably, I'd say, a good 20 feet from the edge of the road, and shining our spotlights in the uh, general direction of where the cat was, kind of behind us. And then we kind of directed our spotlights across the road up in the trees. We were basically looking for possibly any other signs of people or, you know, any animals that might have been out there, coyotes or whatnot, that have been chewing on it. And we saw a set of eyes up in the tree. And I'd say that set of eyes was, whatever that critter was, was probably maybe 20 feet off the edge of the road on the other side of the road from where we were sitting. So probably within not more than 50, 60 feet from us. And I'd say he was probably all at 20, 30 feet up in the tree, way towards the top of the tree. Now that area is generally, it's all hardwoods, generally kind of a swamp land, a lot of backwater sloughs. You get a lot of raccoons and coyotes in that area. And I've seen a lot of raccoons and coyotes and whatnot in my day through a spotlight and right away I knew something was different something was wrong that feeling like something's wrong you know the back of your neck the hair standing up kind of thing basically a fear like I've never felt before in the woods my whole life up until that point and I saw this set of eyes and I'd say they were probably spaced out further than a human's eyes are spaced out and definitely further than a raccoon which would pretty much be the only thing you'd see in a tree in the southern Wisconsin woods and then we kind of took a few steps closer and I, I go what is that? that's not a raccoon what is that and then all of a sudden it moved a little bit and then we could see the outline of it now mind you it was not far from the road but there were other trees in front of the tree that he was in so we didn't really get a, quite a good look at it but we could see its outline and it looked like a big dark black shadow and i'd say it was bigger than any person i ever seen in my life <laughs> i think i told you earlier like andre the giant size just just a huge animal definitely a lot bigger than a bear definitely a lot bigger than any black bear which you would see in wisconsin and at that time, that would be very rare. And then I saw one eye reflecting back and then no eyes. And it kind of saw this outline shimmying down the tree. I was trying to follow it with the spotlight. And it was breaking every branch down, coming down. And I mean, just huge snaps, like really large branches. And making a heck of a noise. And then a big thud, thump, as it hit the ground. Now, mind you, there's all this leaf litter. It's it's all leaf litter on the ground. All the all the leaves are down, and it made a heck of a noise running through there. But I'll never forget this. It was running through the leaves, and then thump 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 going down the road. And it was running. It was kind of running parallel with the road through the woods, away from us, and then onto the road. As I was following it with a spotlight before it hit the road and kind of got out of our view, it was definitely upright. And the sound that it made running through those leaves, it was definitely bipedal. It was running on two legs. It was not galloping through. It wasn't making any other noise that would indicate, you know, it didn't make the noise indicating that it was on four legs. 
And I looked to my buddy, he looked at me, and he says to me, you think that could have been a person? And he was very shooken up, and I was very shooken up myself. We didn't, you know, we're out there with shotguns loaded up, and, you know, you're you're really not afraid of anything in the woods when you're armed in this part of the world. Uh, there's really nothing out there that can hurt you in Wisconsin for the most part. And we were so scared, we made no pause whatsoever. We got in the truck, and we got the heck out of there. Didn't even think twice. It, it it freaked me out pretty bad to where I didn't I didn't go back out there for a few months. I didn't at night to raccoon hunt. We we chose other spots. We you know drove further than we needed to, just kind of avoided it. And that very night we went and told our dads about what had happened, what we had seen. And I remember my dad telling me, "There's a lot of spooky stuff that goes on out there, and and that's always been a place known for that for as long as he's been around." A lot of folks don't go out there at night for that reason. They don't go out there at night because a lot of spooky stuff happens and people going missing, that sort of thing, and murders and ghosts and UFOs and you name it. And That was kind of piqued my interest in the place, actually. <laughs> Even after that event, I was pretty freaked out, but I thought, wow, you know, this is really cool at the same time. But I didn't go out there for a while. I was pretty scared. Kind of, kind of spooked me, and and I didn't really talk to a lot of people about what happened. I thought people would think I was crazy. I didn't talk about it with any of my other friends, and uh, not for a while anyway. But then the event happened. Uh, I'd say, you know, six months later in April. That was even, in a sense, kind of worse than what happened that night. Before we get into the details of that encounter in the following April, I've got some questions for you about this one. Did you ever get a chance through all this to see any kind of a leg structure on this subject? The only thing I could tell you is whatever it was, it wasn't... It it was almost upright as it ran. It was definitely maybe a little hunched over as it was going through the woods coming up to the road and that's where we kind of lost it but we could see the outline and in it whatever it was it was definitely fast it was very very fast i'd say definitely faster than a human could run maybe 30 35 miles an hour 40 miles an hour something like that it moved quickly this all happened as it hit the ground after that thump i'd say he was 100 yards down the road before we could you know you couldn't hear him anymore in a matter of a couple seconds. I mean, he was, whatever it was, it was fast, very, very fast. And I would think a bear, even on its hind legs, couldn't move that fast in a million years. It was just moving. And that was part of the whole creepy factor about it all was the eyes, the largeness of it, and the fact that it could move as fast as it did down through the woods and then onto the road. I mean, it was it was hauling, it was hauling, so to speak. It was, you know, it was probably the creepiest thing about it, how fast it was moving through there. Yeah, it sounds like that must have been one heck of a sight to see. I know you mentioned how dark everything was. Its fur seemingly soaked up the light from the spotlight that you had. But through all of this, did you ever get a good enough look to? get a feel for whether it leaned more towards being a dog man possibly or lean more towards being a sasquatch well thinking about it that night i never gave one thought to it being a bigfoot or a sasquatch not one thought whatever it was it was sleek and it moved like the wind and it it was almost like a ghost i, I guess if that for lack of a comparison it was almost like a ghost like it made noise as it was going through the woods, but it just floated. And of course, at that time in my life, I was familiar with Bigfoot sightings. I think just about everybody was in this world at that point <laughs> in time. But it, I never gave a second thought to it being a Bigfoot. It was almost as if in the back of my mind, it was something unnatural, definitely unnatural, but never seen before. And that's kind of the what my buddy and I took from it. 
like it was something new. You know what I mean? As far as peering through the woods and getting the look at it, you can almost, I won't say you make out a muzzle, because at first he had thought maybe it was a person playing a prank. Now, we both knew that there's no way that was a person. There's no way that somebody would be sneaking out there, and they that'd take a lot of gall to dress up and wear a costume and have something where your eyes would reflect and be up in a tree like that. I mean, it was just the elaborate nature of it. Nobody would do that, you know, and, and there was nobody else out there. You could see up and down that road on the parking lots, and you would have to park on the road or in the parking lots, which are right next to the road. There was nobody else out there. So it would have to have been somebody who was dropped off. But it seemed kind of sleek. It wasn't really super bulky, but it was really tall. It was kind of large in stature, I guess. I'd say all of seven feet. It was definitely a lot taller than I am, and I'm 6'3". And I could tell that whatever it was went through the woods, oh, apart from its its footprints and you know, its footfalls and the sound that it made coming down the tree, it was whew, like a wind just whew, right through there. And you just hear on the road and it was gone. That to me, I, I couldn't imagine would be a Bigfoot. But later on, the, the second encounter I had with, a, with another friend, a different friend, that really told me it was nothing that was ape-like or... <laughs> I mean, this thing was, that growling noise it made was something otherworldly, and it wasn't afraid of people. It's more so like almost as if it was bothered by us being there, territorial kind of thing. Like, what are you doing in my my habitat kind of thing. Before we move on to that second encounter there, Paul, I've got one last question about that first sighting you had. Through all this, what kind of color did you see from its eye shine, or did you see any eye shine? There was definitely an eye shine. It was basically the same color you would see from a deer or any other animal shining back, but the eyes were spaced really far apart, really far apart, almost as if the eyes may have been on the side of the skull, almost like a dog, (laughs) when I think about it. They didn't seem natural either. They seemed large, of, of good size. It wasn't real small like a deer, or maybe a, like a, definitely not a raccoon or anything of that nature or a possum. But the thing that really got me was it was almost as if the spotlight was absorbed by its fur. And you could kind of see the outline. You could see that this thing was very dark. Like I said, it was almost like a shadow. And you could kind of see, like, the frills. Whatever it was, was hairy. It was definitely hairy. I kind of looked back, and I thought, maybe I tried to convince myself that maybe it was a black bear. Whatever it was, the eyes were too far apart to be a black bear. And it was definitely one single animal. It was definitely watching us while we were in the parking lot investigating the cat, and it didn't make any noise. We didn't hear any noise up until the point where we hit it with the spotlight, and it took off running. It took off down the tree and then off into the woods and then onto the road. But it it seemed to me maybe the head was kind of narrow on it. It wasn't, wasn't uh, real big, maybe about the size of a man's head. And it didn't really seem like, how do I put this? It didn't really seem to be that large. It, it seemed almost kind of lean, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like cut. Like it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really bulky of an animal. It was sleek in design, so to speak. But it was really tall, and I could tell from, I guess, the arms of it. His arms were really long, and you could kind of make that out a little bit through the trees. It knew right away, as soon as the spotlight hit it, it was a matter of seconds. It was down the tree and, and out of there. So this all kind of happened, not too fast, but relatively fast. 
what seems like minutes is really seconds kind of thing. It definitely caught us off guard, but you know, I felt after seeing that cat in the tree, you know, I, I knew something was wrong. I knew something wasn't right. I've never seen anything like that in my life. I would think a person wouldn't do something like that. I would hope <laughs> that somebody wouldn't do that. But, yeah, it, it definitely uh, it was hard to see through the trees, but we could make the outline of it out. And it was very, I won't say ape-like, but more human-like in shape, but very large in stature. Just because what you saw didn't have a disproportionately large head, that doesn't preclude the chance that it was, in fact, a dog man. I realize you didn't get a good enough look to see exactly what it was, but it just might have been one. Let's get into this second encounter here, Paul, the one that you mentioned as being even scarier than the first. Yeah. I would say it was probably around April, about six months later. My friend and I were out fishing that night, and we decided to drive down this old gravel trail that went along the river. This particular spot was, you know, a few hundred yards away from that parking lot back in November where we had seen what we'd seen in the tree. So we drove out there. It was late at night, probably around 8 or 9 o'clock. We lit a campfire, and we got to fishing, and we were sitting around the campfire and him hawing about our day and our week and, you know, reconnecting. And this particular guy was a coworker of mine. And we went to high school together. He was a few years older than me, and we were kind of reconnecting. And it was kind of our chance to hang out together, and we figured, hey, let's go fishing out in Avon Bottoms. (laughs) So it got to be around midnight or so. I want to say we'd fish for three hours. Unfortunately, we didn't catch anything. And it was early enough in the year where we beat the mosquitoes, and it just was a perfect night, beautiful night. Uh, clear night, again, no moon, but we had the light of the fire and the comfort of the fire, and it got to the point where, you know, we got to work tomorrow, we got things to do tomorrow, let's pack it up. So we grabbed our fishing poles and all of our tackle and got it in the truck, and we were sitting around the fire on our buckets, just watching the fire die down. And I'd say... A good five minutes went by or so. We didn't have a word to say to each other. We were just sitting there almost like a trance, just sitting there next to the fire, just staring at the fire. And then out of nowhere, and I mean, there was no warning. There was no noise, no branches breaking, nothing like that. Directly behind us, we hear a growling and a snarling, and it was just so guttural and loud. It was almost like, like real snarly, and it was almost as if I could feel it on the back of my neck, almost as if it was right behind me, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I said, get in the truck, and we bolted right into the truck, which was right there, thank God, right next to us. We jumped in the truck peeled out of there and didn't even think twice about looking behind us or slowing down. It was accelerated the whole way to the road and then onto the road. That noise was nothing like any bear, mountain lion, wolf, coyote, a gorilla, you name it. It sounded like nothing I've ever heard before in my life, almost as if it was a human doing it to mess with us. That's kind of what I tried to convince myself yet again, that maybe it was a person out there messing with us. And like we had said, you know, it takes a lot of guts to be out roaming around in the middle of nowhere at night just to come up on somebody and scare them like that. But I felt deep down inside, and, and, he, and to this day, my poor friend, he will not talk about it. He does not like talking about it. He had nightmares from it. I mean, it scared him to the point where he never wanted to go back out in the woods again. I don't even think he deer hunts anymore because of that. I mean, it really scared the bejesus out of him. 
And I was scared to the point where I didn't go back out there for a long time. And I promised myself I would never go back there alone, let alone unarmed. Because that particular night, I didn't have a firearm on me. We were fishing, and you know, I kind of had calmed down from the first experience to where I didn't really feel threatened, per se. But after that night, I don't think I've ever been out there without being armed, without having a firearm on me for that reason. I lost sleep about it. I, uh, you know, at the back of my mind, I kind of wish maybe I had looked behind me to see what it was that made the noise. And then there's a part of me that's glad I didn't because <laughs> I don't think I could have handled seeing what it was. Whatever it was, I kind of want to say that I didn't have any preconceived notions. I knew nothing about the dog man or werewolf sightings in southern Wisconsin. I had no idea of any of that at that point in my life. I felt that whatever it was that I saw and whatever it was that I heard the second time, the second experience, was unnatural. It was something that didn't belong out there. It was not an uh, animal that you would find anywhere in in a zoo or anywhere in the Midwest or North America. This was just something totally unnatural, and I I felt that I had enough education and schooling under my belt that maybe I could figure out what it was and, you know, try to reason with myself and try to come up with an explanation. And I couldn't. And, it, and, and that itself bothered me deeply. It, it, and to this day, it haunts me. It really does. I guess as far as being a skeptic, I'm more or less a skeptic. I don't really believe in UFOs or ghosts or any of that sort of thing. Those encounters kind of changed my thought about the paranormal or the unexplained. And through a little bit of research, I kind of discovered cryptozoology and seen that it was it's a legitimate science. It's a, it's a thing. And a lot of people have had similar experiences. It kind of became an obsession after that. It was a, like a search for the truth sort of thing where I would go out there even by myself, armed to the tooth with a camera and a, a rifle and a pistol on my side and maybe a shotgun on my back, going out there at night, trompsing around, hoping that maybe I would catch a glimpse of this thing and, and have... I guess, for lack of a better word, some sort of closure. And this went on for a lot of years. I guess, fortunately, I never saw anything for a lot of years or experienced anything for a lot of years. But in that time, I had met a lot of people from that area who had had similar experiences. One that really stands out is a farmer that I had met. It was kind of an odd experience back in the woods in my vehicle. I was back in the woods in my vehicle and I got stuck and I had to walk to the nearest farmhouse and ask a farmer to come out and pull me out. He pulled me out and I got back to his house and he had said to me, I don't want anything in repayment. He asked me what I was doing out there that late at night. looked like I was hunting. And I told him, yeah, kind of, in a sort of way. <laughs> well, I was kind of coyote hunting, but I had a weird experience out here. Because he had questioned why I had so many firearms on me and the lights I had. Definitely a tactical setup. Almost as if I was going to war. <laughs> so I explained to him why, and I told him my experiences. And I remember him saying... You know, you never know what you're going to find out here in the bottoms. And he proceeded to tell me a story about a calf that he had out in his pasture that the next morning was not there. And he went out to investigate, and he found a big pool of blood and drag marks through the pasture. And then up over his, I'd say, all the four feet, maybe five foot high barbed wire fence. And then into the woods... And then that was it. That was all he saw of any evidence of what had happened to his calf. And he said, you know, I've been a farmer my whole life and my family, and I've lived out here most of my life, and I, I'll be honest with you, it, it scared me to the point where I keep a shotgun next to my door 
because you just never know, you know, what's out there. We got to talking a little bit more, and you know, it definitely wasn't a bear or a mountain lion or anything like that. It's going to have the strength to pull a, a calf over a fence like that and then drag it off in the woods and not even leave a carcass. It's almost as if it just disappeared. So that kind of got my mind going, and a lot of other stories uh, about the history of that town and basically what that town has gone through and kind of died off. And there's kind of a tone of despair and, and evil, so to speak, in that area, almost as if like it's a place where things go to die. And a lot of mystique around that area and stories that people talk about. That town was at once on its way to flourishing and being something big and the railroad company decided to quit halfway through the project and change their pathway to another town and the town kind of died with it. So there's kind of this uh, feeling of everything just kind of dying out in that area and, and people kind of a negative feel to it, so to speak. Before we move on and get too far from that second encounter there, Paul, I've got some things I want to ask you about. When you heard that growling coming from what seemed like right behind your head, were both of you sitting side by side staring at the camp TV, or did you have a little bit of distance between you where you kind of were looking at the campfire at somewhat of an angle relative to each other? We were probably five or six feet apart, staring straight at the campfire. And then just beyond the campfire was the river and the woods that was behind us. I remember asking him later on in life if he had ever seen what it was that we heard. That's kind of how I led into it. I said, Mike, you uh, you remember that night we were out there in Avon and we were fishing around the fire and we heard that growling behind us? His response to that was, stop. He's like, I don't ever want to talk about that again. I'm like, you didn't see it? Did you ever look? And he goes, I don't ever want to talk about it again. He's like, please, just, he's like, I've been fighting my whole life to forget that night. It was very traumatic for him, and I, I can't help but feel maybe he did see it, and that's why it, it was so traumatic for him. I don't really see him much anymore, but when I have, I, I don't bring it up to him. It was almost like a post-traumatic stress kind of incident for him. He was pretty shooken up by it, and I remember at that time, over 12 years ago, 13 years ago, he didn't want to talk about it after that at work. He actually kind of had me promise him that I wouldn't tell anybody about what happened, or he made it very clear he was never going back out there with me again. After living through something like that, I can't say I'd blame Mike for not wanting to. You know, if there was about five, six feet of distance between you two sitting around that campfire, there must have been enough angularity between you two where when that sound came from right behind your head, I'd be astonished if Mike didn't get a glimpse, at least a glimpse, at what it was that was making that sound. Now, I'm not going to get into whether you or Mike had a Charmin moment. What a man does in his pants is nobody's business but his own, but I've got to really give it to you. It seems like you didn't have any such problems. I can tell you honestly, I definitely would have dropped a river monster if something like <laughs> that happened right behind my head. Yeah, I had all I could do to keep my wits about me. It was just, it was almost like adrenaline and instinct kicked in. It was just beeline right to the truck, which is maybe five, six feet away from him. I was 10 feet from the truck. We were in there in a, in a heartbeat and down the road without even looking back, without any hesitation, we just bolted into the truck. I left the fire going and everything. I mean, it was just, there was there was no way we were going to waste even half a second getting out of there. It was a long time down the road, probably halfway back to Beloit, before I could catch my breath and calm down. And we really didn't say anything to each other. We were pretty scared. We were pretty freaked out. I kind of told him, I said, I don't know what that was. He goes, I ain't never heard anything like that in my life. I said, hey, I'm not going back out there. He said, I'll never go back out there again. And I dropped him off, and I know he didn't sleep well that night, and I didn't either. 
I was pretty scared. I think I, I came home and laid down with a gun next to my bed and, you know, afraid maybe it would follow us back or something. And I always thought maybe it was just like a, almost like in the back of my mind, like it was a demon or some entity following us or following myself. Your your mind's turning, your the wheels in, in your mind are just going 5,000 RPMs, just going crazy, and you, you, you can't collect your thoughts and think rationally after that for a while. Uh, pretty pretty scared, very scared. It was, uh, it was a hard thing to deal with for a while. Oh, you better believe it was a hard thing to deal with. Everything that you went through after that experience is very typical of eyewitnesses who see these things or have up close and personal the way that you and Mike had. So please don't second guess your response to what happened that night. You know how it is, Paul, when you stew pot about something like that that's that traumatic, you're going to think about it so many times and so many different ways that it's easy to twist it and turn it around in your mind. You second guess your response to what happened that night. At any point through all of this, as you've been evaluating your response to what happened there that night, have you ever kicked yourself for not turning around to see what it was breathing down your neck? Oh, definitely. After those first two experiences, I spent years and years out there. A lot of my friends thought I was maybe a little crazy, I guess. I would go out there all the time because, I, like I said, I, I wanted some sort of closure, I guess. You know, I wanted to be able to see what it was that I had heard and um, experienced out there and, and the eyes, what was behind the eyes, you know, what was it exactly that I was looking at. It really haunted me. It, I guess now that I'm a lot older, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> I didn't see it because it, I, I felt that maybe it would have hindered me from my love of outdoors and, and created more fear. I guess now as an adult, I have a lot more respect for the outdoors and what can happen and what might possibly be out there. It's one of those things where it's kind of a catch-22, I guess. I've come to terms with it and I've kind of moved on. But a lot of that had changed. I guess there was uh, the night I was home here. My parents, we just got done eating dinner. And uh, my dad usually watched the History Channel. You know, it was kind of his, his nightly habit where he would finish dinner and he'd turn on the History Channel to unwind before he went to bed. And they had just come out with that show, Monster Quest. He was flipping through the channels, and he gets to the History Channel, and then all of a sudden, it was almost like fate. Boom, right away, they show footage, and it says in the corner, Rock County, Wisconsin, and it was Nelson Road. My dad, of course, had remembered the stories that I had told him about what happened out there. You know, his response is, right away, I, without me even saying anything, hey, isn't that, that's Avon Bottoms. I said, yeah, so that's Nelson Road. He goes, that's where all that weird stuff happened to you. I'm like, yeah. And kind of sat in silence and watched the episode. And I, of course, my friend that was with me the first night, I, I called him right away. He lives in a different time zone. And I said, listen, you got to turn this show on. It's a premiere, so it'll be on in an hour or whatever. Just wait and watch it. And I called me back. As soon as it aired, he in the middle of the show, he called me right away, freaking out. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, that's what we saw. That's what we saw. Like that's what I remember from it. To this day, we can tell each other the same story, you know, and tell it to one guy, and he'll get the same story. We remember it like it was yesterday. The eyes and the tree and the running through the woods. I'll never forget the first two experiences, but the third one definitely will, will sit in the back of my mind for a very long time. I, I know I won't forget it, and I, I know that it kind of was like a solidification of my fear of the woods at night and coming from a guy who was an avid hunter at night uh, I would go out all by myself all the time I'll never go back into the woods at night unarmed or by myself it won't happen I, I I'm just too afraid to do it 
unfortunately. But maybe at the same time, it's a good thing. You know, maybe that's why I'm still alive to tell the tale. <laughs> Who knows? That could very well be. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and talk about that third encounter that you had. It was winter, early uh, winter of 2012, maybe January or February. I decided to go out there coyote hunting. There was times where I had been out there uh, by myself in that same exact situation and never had a problem. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, maybe about six or eight inches by Wisconsin standards, not too bad. And good fresh fall and snow, clear night. There was a little bit of moonlight to where I could see going through the woods without a flashlight. It was perfect. Uh, went down to Nelson Road where I usually went to hunt coyotes. There's an open field on the edge of the woods that I would normally hunt. Well, that particular night, I, I decided, well, I'm going to be a little lazy and just take the trail, try to avoid the snow drifts and whatnot, and kind of hunker down in the woods and have a little bit better cover maybe for hunting. So I took the old trail. Now, since the days where you could drive on it, which were about 10 years prior, they had blocked that all off. It had overgrown could only get to the trail by foot. Unfortunately, a lot of people were out there four-wheel driving in the prairie restoration areas, just on the other side of the woods, and people dumping their trash and their uh, bags of garbage and couches and washing machines and tires and whatnot. So the DNR would come out there and block that trail off, which is a good thing, you know, keep people out of there doing that sort of stuff. But it made it kind of harder to walk through that area and get back into the woods. So I parked my car on the road and I walked down where the trail used to be and there's a big pile of trees that they'd fell uh, across the trail so that people couldn't drive back there. So you had to walk around that. I'd say it took me about 10 minutes to get to where I was on the trail. And there's an old tree falling down across the trail further up and I figured, oh, that's a good spot to sit. So I'm within a stone's throw of the river, pretty much right next to the river, leaning up against this tree, sitting down on my butt, hunkered down kind of behind the tree, and I started my caller up. I called for about 10 minutes and nothing happened. No response. Uh, tried to locate her call, no coyotes uh, calling back. And then I hear through the snow, and it's coming right at me from behind me, deep further in the woods. This all happened in a matter of like a second, and it scared the heck out of me. A deer whew, jumps right over this tree that I'm leaning up against. It's falling down along the ground, and it looked like a doe maybe. I don't know, a small deer, and it was not even 10 feet away. <laughs> I thought, wow, right there, you know, and she was, or, or he, that deer was moving fast fast it wasn't just trotting through it was moving the whole time from when i had started to hear it until i couldn't see it anymore and then i heard another deer and it jumped over the tree that i was leaning against just a little bit further down and it was moving real fast and then i heard another deer a third deer and it was moving fast it kind of reminded me of the first jurassic park where the t-rex is chasing the gallimimus dinosaurs through the field the paleontologist loses something along the lines of, you know, it's being chased by a predator. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, maybe there's coyotes or wolves chasing these deer. Uh, there's no reason for them to just be running crazily through the woods for no reason. You know, obviously something's chasing them. I kind of got excited. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to see a coyote, uh, be able to shoot a coyote. And it'll come running right through here, and I'll have a shot at it. Well, that wasn't the case. I, I heard a fourth deer, and I knew it was a deer because I, I, I didn't see it. I could hear the galloping, the crunching through the snow, and all of a sudden I hear thud, like just through the snow, almost like a the sound a sled would make if you're sliding down a hill and it comes to a stop. And I heard bleeding. I've deer hunted, and I know what a deer sounds like when it's injured, and it's a heck of a noise. And it was bleeding, and then another thud, and then nothing. And then I hear this noise, like a 
almost like a snorting noise, like like heavy breathing, something really large. And then I hear the sound of what sounded like the deer being drug off into the woods, away from where I was at. And I got up, and I'm kind of peering through the woods, and I couldn't see anything. And I had my tack light on my, my AR, and I lit that up and kind of trying to see if I can catch eyes or something. And then I hear this, like, snarling, real light, and it's like a like agitated kind of sound. And I took off running. I, I Right into that instance, I thought, that's the werewolf. That's the dog, man. That's that's this freaking critter that I've been seeing out and hearing out here and stories and everything I've heard. And I just, I, I freaked out. I took off running through the snow. I think I made the 10 minute, what would normally be a 10 minute walk in about a minute of running as fast as I could. And uh, I kind of hate to say this and it's, you know, not a, a very uh, ethical or safe way to be operating a firearm in the wilderness at night, but I started firing my gun into the air and kind of behind me as I was running. I unloaded the magazine, I popped another one in, I just kept firing all the way to my car, just trying not to pass out from fear. I mean, I was just shaking and so scared, and I'm, you know, I get back to my car and pretty much just threw the gun in the car, didn't even think about unloading it or casing it or anything. I, I just got in my car and I got out of there as fast as I could and got down the road and I got about halfway to Boyd and I, I called the uh, the DNR number and of course there wasn't a warden available at that time of night and uh, kind of left in my story. Uh, I didn't want to sound too crazy but I said something took down a deer not far from me in the woods while I was coyote hunting and told them where I was at in the uh, voicemail message and I think somebody needs to go out there and investigate. Unfortunately, I never got a response at all from that. I came home and I called a few people and I thought, man, I, we got to get somebody out there in the morning. We got we got to go out there. We got to look for tracks. And I won't lie. I kind of made it sound like maybe I thought it was a mountain lion. I think we all know that uh, a mountain lion isn't going to take down a deer and make that kind of noise. And, you know, it's like real guttural. <laughs> And, and drag it through the woods, through the snow, you know, six, eight inches of snow. Unfortunately, that morning, real early, later that night and that morning, it had snowed a little bit and there was a lot of wind. I went out there. I actually found somebody to go out there with me the next day and went back to where we thought maybe the, the deer had been taken down. And sure enough, there was a drag mark through the snow. And you could kind of kick the top layer of snow away and see blood there was these really large tracks almost maybe a regular person size it wasn't definitely not a mountain lion or a wolf or something like that not real big but uh you, you could kind of see it where the snow had blown over there was these indentations in the snow where whatever it was was on two legs this is not something on four legs dragging it through we followed the trail as far as we could. Now, walking through that snow for a long ways will take a lot out of a guy. And, you know, even a guy in really good shape, you know, you make it about half a mile through the snow and you're uh, you're pretty beat up. We made it as far as we could go through the woods. And it ended up, seemed like it was dragging alongside the river through uh, what looked like deer runs or game trails. And... It got to the point where my buddy and I both were like, I can't go any further. We got to walk all the way back. And, you know, we were kind of freaked out from the whole thing to begin with. And I thought, yeah, hey, let's just get out of here. You know, I kind of kicked myself to this day because that was, that was around the time, you know, 2012, pretty much everybody had a cell phone with a camera on it. I kind of wish I would have documented it for some reason. I, I don't know why we didn't, but it's one of those things, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But after that experience, I decided I wasn't going to be going out there anymore. And my dad and I had a little chat the night that it happened. And he's like, you know, you shouldn't go out there tomorrow. He's like, you, know, you, should just, you just need to quit going out there to begin with. 
you don't need to find out what's going on out there. Just leave it alone. Let it be. So since then, you know, I had moved up to Green Bay, and now I'm back in the Beloit area. I, I just don't go out there anymore at night, and you know, I, I don't feel a need to, you know, let sleeping dogs lie kind of thing, no pun intended. You know, just let it be. And recently there was a group of people that I met up with out there, and we went out there during the day, and I kind of showed them where everything happened and told them about what had happened, and they... uh you know, they showed great interest in it, but, uh, you know, there's, there's also a respect there. You kind of wonder, maybe these three incidences where my friends and I experienced this, we were lucky that it didn't attack us. You know, it didn't feel threatened enough to make a move. We didn't do anything rash or stupid like approach it or get closer, you know, and... and I'm kind of glad we never did. <laughs> so I've kind of found my sense of closure is is talking to people about it, especially people with similar experiences, people that uh, have uh, experienced things that go bump in the night, so to speak, in that particular area and other areas of the country. That's kind of where I stand with it now. It is one of those places where you know you could get lost. Search and Rescue has come out there to go get people out of there. And people have gone missing. People have been murdered out there. There's a lot that can happen. And I guess, for lack of a better term, I'm not trying to push my luck. <laughs> so I don't go out there at night alone ever and probably never will again. If I do go out there, it's during the day. And at least if I'm armed, I feel like I might have a better chance of protecting myself versus if I'm unarmed. But you never know with a large animal like that. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that. Paul, after what you've been through with those three experiences, the fact that you're not just hiding underneath your bed day and night, that says a lot about your moxie. A lot of people would just have such a hard time going out in public after such experiences so whatever you have to do to feel comfortable and confident whether you swear off the woods at night or you name it more power to you i don't think anyone would have a hard time understanding you doing that before we get out of here do you have any closing comments you'd like to share always give thought to what might be behind you in the woods and have a respect for the wilderness at night and keep your head on a swivel because you just never know what's going to happen and as much of a skeptic as I was growing up and trying to fight with it later in life after the first couple experiences you just never know and you know it's good to keep an open mind and be wary and well, the most important thing is to have respect for nature and what might be out there because you never know that's right you never do know well said Thanks again so much for coming on, Paul. I really do appreciate it. You bet, Vic. Thanks for the time, and thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.